for sheer abundance of talent, there can hardly be a writer alive who surpasses V.S. Naipaul, said the New York Times book review of the man who's often cited as the best writer in the English language. Born in Trinidad to Hindu parents and educated at Oxford, he has won Britain's highest literary honors. The author of more than 20 books, including the classic A House for Mr. Biswas, his latest novel is Away in the World, and I am very pleased to have him here. Welcome. Thank you. It's, uh, how do you feel about the, I mean, it's a silly question, so I won't ask it. I mean, it, it is, you know, when, when you do what I do, and someone says, and you read things that say, along with Saul Bellow, you know, the best craftsman writing in the English language yes. today. Yes. You know, yes. you say, well, show it to me. Where is this? <laughs> you know, yes. and let me read and let me make sure that I've read it and, and absorbed all of that. I mean, it is that yes. notion of what in our society of sort of ultimate accolades. Yes, um, yes, yes. I actually, I, I think that, I don't think that that's a good way because I think writing is so varied. There's so yes. many kinds of writers. We read for so many different reasons. I don't think that writers can be compared one with the other. Every writer has his own voice. It's awfully hard to compare one when with the other. When did you find yours? Uh, I mean, you, you went when to... When did I find mine? It's a steady process. It's, it isn't something you find and then uh, exploit. It is something that you have to develop. So one starts to learn to write. Perhaps with me, it was in my mid-twenties, quite late. Yeah. I made a conscious effort to break with the writing I had done at school and at the university and to write a narrative in a very direct, uh, clear, simple yeah. way because and develop from that. Yeah. You were acclaimed in your late 20s. Acclaimed? Well, yes, Mr. Biswas, I yes, suppose. It was. Yes. But uh, because, uh, because one came from a very small community and uh, there was no market for that kind of work at the time in the English-speaking world, uh, one had to go ahead from that. One couldn't rest on one's oars ever. One had to develop and move. Uh, and having exploited one kind of material, the material of my childhood and my background, I had to find ways of dealing with the fact that I had moved out into the larger world. And one constantly came across various intellectual ditches in the way that I had to leap. So there's a progression. One is striving ever to deal with more and more material, to find a way of looking at more and more, more and more countries, put it crudely, more and more cultures, more and more kinds of history. You have said, that one of the things that propelled you forward is that you had no alternative uh, to I write. I had no alternative, no. I, I mean, you, that was a motivating force and a disciplined demand. Yes, and what else could I have done? I, I couldn't see it. I, I, went, I went to Oxford. I, I got a scholarship. I, in those days, a scholarship enabled one to get any profession. I could have become an engineer. I could have become a doctor. Uh, a lawyer. I went to Oxford and did English because I wanted to be a writer. And having just, as it were, thrown away my chance of a profession, yeah. uh, I just, I had to stick with it. I wanted to stick with it. To me, it was a very noble thing to be. But your father taught you that? I felt it because of his example and because of seeing him and his, I his ideas about writing. Yeah. He was a journalist? Yes. Why was it noble? Uh, it was so pure. It dealt in truth. It dealt in reality. How did he teach you that? Well, no, I was aware of it from seeing from the way seeing. he wrote. Yeah. His and how example, he felt about right. His example and his concern with the truth uh, in his writing and possibly even the things he told me. Uh, uh, it was lying, complicated things. And I've been passionate about trying to tell mm. the truth in, in writing. That to have a, a cause to corrupt vision for the sake of a cause, however good the cause, is wrong. The writing does deal with, with reality. Mm. You travel so much because it's, it's the odyssey looking for truth in different places? No, no, I travel because if you come from a small society, you're quickly ex uh, exhausted. And, uh, yeah, but you've gone back to it. But only after having made this long journey outside and being able to look at it as it were to see the world in it to see the world in 
in microcosm in it. If, a, if one had stuck with the small world, there was, there's very little to say about small societies beyond uh, a certain point. They are very limited. Help me understand that. Yes. There's very little to say. You can't take a small society as a microcosm no. of any larger no. No, you can't. No, society and say the conflicts here essentially are the conflicts of any society. No, no, because uh, you, uh, certain societies are so limited. Shall we say an agricultural society? Uh, a plantation. These are, these islands are plantations. These fixed societies have no c no relationship to an industrial. Exactly. These these, these are plantations. These small colonial right. societies right. in that part of the New World, and people have worked it, worked out that there might be eighty kinds of jobs you can do. So, the pos human possibility is always limited, and it it limits the writing. It limits human adventure. It limits the play of mind. Why the fascination with Sir uh, Walter Raleigh? A liar. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, who I'm went? Who went back to to, to save it, to just to get out of jail? Yes, and uh, he he lied about about everything. And well, now why do people lie? I think people people who uh, in that small society we've been talking about. Uh, it is the one way people have of uh, giving themselves dignity. They lie. They lie about the past. They lie about uh, 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 themselves. They lie about passion. But when they lie, it would seem to me to, to falsely construct, to construct a lie, you, you know you're doing that. So why does that give you dignity? How can you make that leap of faith to give you dignity Well, or esteem? If this you know it is a facade yes. all along, yes. I said do you have to convince yourself that it's not a facade? I mean, somehow you do some kind of trick. I mean, I, I know that they are said about certain people, yes. they create the image they want to be. Yes. They decide. I mean, they even said this about, say, certain warriors. Yes. They decided what the image of a warrior was. Yes. And they constructed themselves so that they forgot yes. who they were at their yes. core, and they became the facade. Well, probably all human beings have this, this, this element of play, this element of madness. But the thing about the liar, the confidence man, is that with 90% of his being, he believes his lie. And this is where the, he, he's very corrupt. This is where he's very uh, convincing. Uh, and he loses sight of what's truth and what's lie. Yes, yes. And um, the confidence man believes his lie, and that happens so often. You also, in a way, in the world, double back to things you have written before. Yes. Is it to get it right because you want to improve on it, or because life's experience is constantly recreating what you have done before? Yes. Uh, you, you don't actually finish with one truth, yeah. because what you write when you're 20, clearly you, you feel differently about when you're 40. Uh, and you might be over generous or over petulant at one stage that you wish to go back to the material, or you might wish to take it at another angle. Uh, and this is what I did here. I settled certain accounts, things which were hanging in my mind as unachieved or unachieved, uh, especially about the forms I'd use in certain yeah. early books. I borrowed certain forms wrote other people's kind of books, and I wanted to write my own with that material. It's no good pouring your own material into somebody else's form. That is essentially writing somebody else's book. And you were doing that earlier in well, your life? No, in two or three occasions, which have, and they, they worried me immensely. <laughs> I've been tormented by it. Really? And I've settled Tormented? The, yes, yes, felt ashamed. Well, did, did you talk about it? I mean, do, or was it such an embarrassment that, I mean, in your writing, it's all out there. You must have thought maybe other people know this, or am I the only one who really no, knows? No, one likes one work, one's work very much in the moment of doing it. And for many years afterwards, one, one, one loves it. I know it often by heart for a long time afterwards. It takes a long time before you begin to judge it again. You begin to think it's flawed. You wonder why. What, how long do you, what do you like when you're writing? I mean, you don't write fast. No. But no. you write every day, and you try to average about 400 words a day. No, can't do it like that. I, I mean, know. I would say 
it, uh, one good day might be followed by, I know. by but, lots but, of bad But isn't days. there an average, though? No. About? No, it's no, not. No. Well, I've no. seen that written about you, so obviously the, all the things written about you are not true. No, I think, I think what, what might be said is that uh, probably on a good day I might write 300. I might do a page on a good day. A page? A page on a good yeah. day. That's a very good day. And if I try to do more, I'll pay a yeah. price for the next two days. There's only so much juice in the human brain, after all, so much creativity. To, when the words, to reduce emotion, thought to word, is a very difficult thing. The words have to be captured, they have to be dancing in, in your head, and you have to get it right. As you get older, it doesn't get easier. You have so many ways of saying things, there's so many alternatives. It takes a long time to do the sifting. Is, is sifting and choice agonizing? I mean, is it, is yes. that, it, it is the choice because you're, you've achieved a certain level of knowledge, of experience, so you can do it better, but it makes more difficult because you have more options, more avenues. You wish to get it right. You wish to get the words right. And you have a higher sense of what's right. And the angle. You have, a, you have a higher, let's say you have a more particular sense. You have a shrewder sense. Uh, you have to satisfy yourself. You're, there must be nothing in your writing which worries you, which sticks out, which offends you. It has to be right. Uh, and it, revision, therefore, can be difficult because you, you have to wait to see the errors coming up. It's like entering a dark room and seeing things slowly emerge, sometimes. Painful? No, that can be exciting. Seeing that that's a, you but see it, does it become exciting at a certain point oh for yes. you? Oh, yes. Know, this last in a sense, you're... Go ahead. This, this book was, uh, the last six months were written in a, in a state of great excitement. And do you just live in that excitement, or does it, in, does it influence the rest of your everything? I mean, are you just into the book, and the excitement is to, you just don't want to let go, and you want to stay with that, that yes, process. Absolutely. And so you, you can't translate that excitement to anything else, because you just want to pour it all into this. It goes into the book, yes. Yeah. yes. One and lives with the work. And how long does it maintain its hold on you after you finish the revision and finally said to the editor, here it is? Well, this one's been, it was with me for about six months. Why six months? Why so long? Well, I was, the parts I knew by heart. I know, I know the whole book by heart, and then parts of it would come back to me, and I would hear it going through my system. I would spend hours just hearing it and living it again and again. I would hear it, I'd be reading it in a way all over again, be working through, like a recreation of the book. Yeah. And then a man wrote me a letter, saying, uh, full of praise and sh sending me a review he'd written for a small, small magazine. And it was such a trivial, vulgar, schoolboyish piece of work. I felt so unhappy that this trivial mind had uh, gone into my work. Contam that I, contaminated I, it? Yes, I felt a sh I felt I, it, it broke the spell and a distance was at once put between me and the book. It happened overnight. I was living day to day with what I had written. You have, you've just, I think, described this as a kind of Magnus memoir. Magnum opus, a big work of... Yeah, I know yes, what Magnum yes, opus is, yes, but this yes. is, this for you, this for yes. you is, is it climactic? Is it, I mean, put this in a perspective of, of all that you have written, and, and, and I will have to tell you uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the respect for your work and the short list of great of Nobel, you know, all that. W put this in terms of what it means to you and how you feel about it. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's left me at peace. With the inheritance of Trinidad? Yes, and this whole colonial inheritance there and all the many strands of it. I've dealt with it philosophically. I've made a whole of it. Because until this time, one has been separating it into, into its various racial components. I've made a whole of it, and I've and included the, the Amerindian past there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I'm at peace. I'd be quite content to, to as it were, to die now. I feel I've, 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 I've left, I've said it, I haven't left things unsaid. And that's what you intended to do as you began the journey? 
Yes, I think what always does a book is that it's going to be the last one. And one wants to put everything into a work because you, you know life is uncertain. Yeah. I want to talk a few things personal about you because yes. we're curious about yes. uh, gifts. Uh, something happened at 40 to you. I mean, it is written and you have said that somehow yes. at eight, around age four, what was it? Probably an illness. What happens, I think, at different stages, uh, uh, every decade is ushered in by some terrible calamity. And what was it at 40? I think uh, an asthmatic seizure, which uh, really upset me. Uh, I, I became ill on an aeroplane. And uh, then I had another one when I was, um, when I was entering 50. Yeah, then I had what, 62? Uh, yes, and, I, and that was, you know, that was, um, things were very bad um, just before I was 60. Kind of bad spine problem. Yeah. So I'm, I'm after hearing your previous guest, uh, I, I'm nervous about what is going to see me into the 70s. <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah. There are those who say, who know you well, who say, I mean, there's a certain direness about. It. I mean, do you have a kind of morbid sense of life? Sense of life? Yes. I mean, morbid it, sense. Yes. Uh, explain that. Well, Go okay. But is there a sense of of um, even at your most moments of great exaltation. Yes. I mean, you just said you could die. You've written this and you've attempted what you do. Yes. Even at your best moments of, yes. of joy, yes. celebration, yes. there is something, there's part of you. Yes. That's, that's morbid, meaning yes. from Latin, meaning yes. ill. Well, yeah, well, yeah or, or, or unhappy or, 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 or depressed. Or. Depressed is the word I'm looking for. I don't think an artist is a depressed, you know. I've thought, did you think of Van Gogh, for example? Yeah, he, that was not depression? I don't think so. I think he was, he was in a state of exaltation doing that beautiful work. He'd have known exactly. He had to know. He would have known exactly how wonderful those drawings were yeah. and the paintings. He would have been in a state of great excitement. So art has its immense reward. Why do we think of so many artists, though, as having... I think it's a kind of middle class uh, <laughs> wish to put artists and writers in their place. Yeah. They're such free men. It is nice to think that they really are secretly and profoundly wretched and unhappy. But in fact, they're probably secretly and profoundly content doing their work. Because it's noble and, as you said in the beginning, pure. Pure, and there's a great joy in making things. Yeah. What's, do you know what's next? Or Oh, no, I'm still rather tired. I haven't yet thought what I'd move on to. I'm still resting. Yeah. I'll rest for a, a little while. I think I'll rest at least for six months. I, I, could, I wouldn't even like to write a, an article. Yeah. You times. just feel like, boy, if you use a baseball metaphor in America, I hit a home run. Oh, goodness. <laughs> you, don't, you mustn't think like that. No. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, but you know what I mean? You, no. you, sit, you did what uh, you attempted to do. Yes, yes. In fact, one always does that with, with, with a piece of work. Yeah. Otherwise, one doesn't surrender it. You, don't you have a clear idea of what you intend to, to do, and you, you, you do that. The thing about certain books is that they achieve another, another, another level. They'll achieve another excitement, or they reach through to another excitement when you're actually doing the work. And then you feel a little elevated by it. Yeah. Uh, that's rather miraculous. It actually happened only twice in my life. First time? First time was when I was uh, 28, 29. Yeah. And then I had to wait full 30 years for this experience again. It happened once in the Raleigh story you mentioned, yeah. for the few weeks I was writing the Raleigh. And then for the six months of, the last six months were written in a state of exaltation. Away in the world, B.S. Naples. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, before I say goodnight this evening, John Barry, an engineer at our station, died this week. He worked at public television for more than 27 years. He was an intrinsic and valuable part of the small team that keeps this program on the air each night. And so we would like to extend our condolences to his family. For all of us, he will be missed. Good night.